Okay, so today they've asked me to speak about diagnosing and treating cataracts, new and emerging treatments. So just to begin, some of you may already know this, but before I start any talk on the eye, I'd just like to go over the anatomy of the eye so we all have the same definitions. Basically, this is the eye cut on cross-section, and let's see if I have this, yeah. Okay, so the front of the eye, oh, is normally we see the eye and the very front part is the cornea, that's the clear part. And then the next part that you see behind the cornea is the iris, that's the colored part that opens and closes to create the pupil. Behind that is our natural lens. The back of the eye is filled with vitreous, which is a clear jelly-like substance. And then the very back has a very thin layer of cells called the retina. That's the part of the eye that we use to see. And it sends electrical signals through the optic nerve to the brain, and that's how we visualize our world. So there are myriad reasons why we have decreased vision as we age. Some of the most common are just a few I'm going to go over today. Often it's just glasses. There are a variety of medical diseases that can affect the eye as we age. People are always worried about age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. And then the talk itself is going to focus on cataract. But just again, so we all have an understanding of all the different things that can happen to our eyes before we focus on cataracts and why it's important to get eye exams, I thought I'd go over the most common ones. So often you just need a new glasses prescription. On the left is the term myopia. This is something a lot of people are familiar with. It's also known as nearsightedness. And people can see up close without glasses but need glasses for distance. Often they need them earlier in life, but they often need to update them as they get older. And as they get older, sometimes they can still remove their glasses and read because at a natural state their eyes can see up close. On the right-hand side is something called presbyopia. This is something that right around age 40, people sometimes start to notice, where they can still see clearly in the distance, but the eye can no longer accommodate like it used to when we were 15. And so the first thing people notice is, oh, maybe I need some reading glasses or computer glasses. And eventually, in order to see well at multiple distances, your ophthalmologist may recommend bifocal or trifocal or progressives, which are the kind where there's no line and you can see at different distances. So what about medical diseases and vision? The most common ones that affect vision in, as we age are high blood pressure and diabetes. This is just a schematic on the left. That's the retina. And that's how diabetes starts to hurt the retina if the blood sugar is out of control. You know, you can have a little bit of bleeding, a little bit of exudate, and then if it continues to be out of control, you can have growth of abnormal blood vessels. And if left unchecked, this is sort of an artist's rendering of what your vision might look like if you were to have those abnormal blood vessels. So this is why with high blood pressure or diabetes, and just in general, it's good to get eye exams to prevent this kind of thing. All right, what about age-related macular degeneration? Well, if we all lived to 120, we would all have it. It's slowly progressive, and at first, it's actually not that much of a problem. But it is something that you want to get checked, because the most common type, dry type, we often recommend that patients start using vitamins and things like that to prevent it from progressing so quickly. And this also occurs in the retina, which is in the back of the eye. And this is an artist's rendering of what happens to your vision with macular degeneration, where you just get central loss, but peripherally you can still see fairly well. Glaucoma is a disease of progression where the pressure inside the eye is too high, and it pushes on the retina as well as the nerves, which just start to have difficulty continuing to do their job. So this is an artist's rendering of what your vision might look like with glaucoma, where you have peripheral vision loss first, and so you may not pick it up, which is why it's important to have regular eye exams if you have glaucoma. Because if you don't pick it up in the periphery and treat it with drops or surgery, it can actually progress to central visual loss. So this is just an example of how cataracts affect our vision. If you have a clear lens, no cataract, you have good, crisp vision. And initially, you can have a mild cataract, which causes overall blurring. But you may not pick it up 
because it's just so mild, but with time and progression, a dense cataract can actually severely blur your vision, and that's when I usually see people. So what is a cataract? Basically, it's just instead of a clear lens, like when you were 15, that lens inside your eye becomes kind of cloudy or yellowed. And it's gradual, happens slowly. And just like a camera does, that lens in the eye is important for focusing images onto the back of the eye on the retina. And if you have a clear lens, it can make a clear image. But if you have a cataract, it scatters the light as well as the image, causing not only blur, but often difficulty with glare. So naturally clear lens, no longer clear, it's cloudy. People talk about it like a window or a camera lens that's frosted and yellowed. But the amount and, pa and pattern can vary. The key thing is it's progressive over time. So it doesn't get better and worse throughout the day. And it's not, you know, oh, Monday it was fine, Friday it was terrible, Monday it was fine again. It's slowly progressive over time. And initially, if it's not in the center or it's very mild, you may not even be aware of it. However, with time, it can progress and eventually cause problems. So some misconceptions. It's not a film over the eye. It's unrelated to the use of the eyes, so you're not going to make it worse by sitting in front of your computer. You don't, it doesn't spread from one eye to the other. Usually you have cataracts in both eyes, although one may progress more quickly than the other. And luckily for us, in the United States, it's not a cause of irreversible blindness because we can offer people cataract surgery. So these are some of the common symptoms people come into my office with. They have blurry vision. Often they have glare or light sensitivity, so they'll be really bothered by oncoming headlights at night while they're driving, or street lamps will have a halo around them. They may also just have poor night vision in general, so they feel like they have to go home and turn on all the lights in their house at night. I have patients who notice difficulty with contrast. They'll pick that up when they're trying to read a glossy magazine most often. Or I have people who say, you know, I just have to turn on every light and put it right above me in order to read comfortably. Some do notice fading or yellowing of colors. Sometimes it's not the patient. My husband wanted me to point out that his father just kept wearing pinker and pinker shirts. <laughs> and he kept saying, no, it's actually salmon. Um, people also, um, and then it went away and his wardrobe changed back. Uh, double vision in one eye. Sometimes people even have triple or quadruple vision in one eye. OK, so I'm going to try and toggle between these to show you guys some videos. And this is just an overview. This is the eye, and this is the same eye on cross-section. And as you can see, here's a perfectly clear lens behind the iris. And the cataract slowly develops at first, kind of clouding that lens, and eventually it gets thicker, such that your vision initially is clear and then just be kind of becomes hazy. And as I was saying, it's very similar to a camera where the camera lens is important for focusing whatever image is coming through and it focuses that light onto the film inside the camera and this creates a perfectly clear picture. But the lens in the eye, when it becomes hazy or cataractous, it can no longer focus that light clearly for the retina. And so the light and comes through the front part of the eye, the cornea, and the, cat and the lens, and then it hits the retina, which is going to send the image to the brain. Normally, it does it in a clear way and gives you a clear picture. But when you actually have a cataract, just like a cloudy lens on your camera would cause a blurry picture, to be taken. That cloudy lens inside the cataract does the same thing for your retina, so now it's a cloudy picture across the entire visual image sent to your brain. So how do you detect a cataract? Well, you need a complete eye exam. And you not only need a complete eye exam to find out if you have a cataract and if it's getting time to take it out, but also to look at your eye for those other eye conditions. Because remember, I pointed out it's important to be monitoring for those as well, not only for the general health of the eye, but also because problems with other parts of the eye, like macular degeneration or glaucoma, can also be responsible for vision loss. And if you have lots of reasons why you're having vision loss and you remove just the cataract, you may still have blurry vision because of those other problems, even if you have cataract surgery. 
So what causes cataracts? Well, aging, mostly genetics. So if your parents had cataracts, probably you'll have cataracts, so will your children eventually. Medical problems, specifically diabetes, can cause a particular kind of cataract. Certain medications can cause cataracts, such as steroids for asthma or other reasons. If you have trauma to the eye, you can have a cataract. Also, a history of radiation for other diseases can exacerbate cataracts. There's a thought that unprotected exposure to UV sunlight makes it worse. Also, a history of previous eye surgery, usually that's retinal surgery. After retinal surgery, a lot of people develop a cataract, and then there are also probably unknown factors, but basically it's a multifactorial etiology. So how fast does it develop? Well, most actually progress, progress gradually over several years, and actually over several decades most of the time. But certain cataracts, like diabetic cataracts or those related to steroids, can kind of happen more quickly over several months, and certain traumatic cataracts can progress over weeks or actually even days. And just so everyone's aware, normally it progresses in one eye first and then the other, so you'll notice the blurry vision in one eye first. So what's the treatment? So far, no medications, dietary supplements, or exercises have been shown to either prevent or cure cataracts. But the good news is, initially, you can just change your glasses prescription sometimes and get it clear again. And honestly, the thing to remember, if it's not bothering you, you don't have to do anything because having a cataract in your eye doesn't hurt your eye. But if it's gotten to the point where it's just deteriorated sufficiently that it's interfering with your activities of daily living, then you can consider cataract surgery. So when do you do it? Well, it's like anything we do in life. You want to do a really good risk-benefit analysis. So when you look at a population of people, you want the cataract to be thick enough for it to make sense to do this surgery. And this is what people talk about. Oh, my doctor said my cataract was ripe or my cataract wasn't ripe yet. Um, that's what they're kind of referring to. And usually that's when the vision is worse than 2040, even with your new pair of glasses on. But the third piece of that puzzle, only you can answer. And that's when your vision loss is sufficiently bad enough that it's keeping you from doing what you want to do during the day. So I have people who come in and say, Dr. Montague, I just can't drive at night anymore and I really want to. Or I can't see the street signs early enough and I'm worried about getting off the highway in time. Or, you know, I've turned on every light in my house and I still can't read. But you want to make sure that, you know, even if you're having symptoms, the benefits to you outweigh the risks. So if you come in and you say, you know, I don't feel good driving at night, but I never drive. My spouse always drives. I'm fine with it. Then you don't need cataract surgery. So the reason we talk about this is because the risks, although rare, compared to heart surgery, it's fantastic, you know, less than one in a thousand, but they still include infection, bleeding, loss of vision, and the need for surgery in the future. And that's why we only do surgery on one eye at a time as well. So what is cataract surgery? Well, we're going to remove the cloudy lens and we do insert a new intraocular lens. So the earliest surgery was actually done by ancient Egyptians. They didn't have new lenses. They actually just did something called couching where they would push the cataract into the back of the eye. And, uh, but it's one of the earliest known surgeries to man. Uh, luckily, we've progressed <laughs> since then. And today, three million Americans have their cataracts removed annually. So how is it done these days? Well, we, I make a small incision. It's actually less than three millimeters. So it closes on its own. I don't have to use any stitches or anything like that. I use something called phacal emulsification to break up the lens, which is directed ultrasound. And then I replace the old cataractus lens with a new intraocular lens. OK. So this is the eye, again, a schematic. And um, again, it just likes to review. This is what a cataract looks like. It's um, your hazy lens is interfering with your vision, and you have to remove it in order to um, improve your vision. So a long time ago, they used to make um, kind of larger incisions. Sometimes people remember, you know, oh, my father, my grandmother had to have stitches, and they had to have sandbags around their head. We don't do that anymore. Um, instead, I make the incision. It's about 2.7 millimeters, and I do it in the cornea, so the risk of bleeding is uh, pretty minimal. We dilate the pupil because we want to be able to access the lens, and then that's just a schematic representation of the phaco machine, which is the phaco emulsification directed ultrasound. 
that I use to break up the lens and we break it into smaller and smaller pieces as it's removed from the eye. And then the reason we're able to use uh, such small incisions is because the advent of a new type of intraocular lens, this is the lens we're going to put in the eye to replace the cataract, and it's now designed um, very well so it can be folded actually in the, into kind of a cylindrical shape and then can be placed inside that tiny incision and once it's in the eye it actually gently unfolds itself and um, it sits inside the bag where your natural cataract used to sit. I know, right? Oh yes, and uh, there's very quick recovery. It's usually blurry and scratchy for a day or two and then you're back to your normal activities. I know, that's good. <laughs> All right, so what can you expect before cataract surgery? Well, as I said, you need an initial eye exam to A, make sure you have a cataract, and B, make sure that that's the reason you're not seeing well. And then you have to have measurements done on your eyes to determine the correct power for that new lens because we want to add the right amount of power for your eye. Those measurements are not perfect, but they're pretty good. We also do a lot of education regarding drops that you're going to use both before and after the surgery, and because we're we study at, you know, avoiding infection at Stanford. We actually have you on uh, drops both three days before and several weeks after surgery in order to prevent infection. We also um, require an anesthesia evaluation because although you're not gonna go to sleep for this surgery, it's not general anesthesia, we do have an anesthesiologist present and they give you medicine to relax you, kind of like having a cocktail, albeit at 7 a.m. And um, they wanna make sure that your heart and lung, everyth lungs, everything is good before you do that. So it is outpatient surgery, so you're gonna come in the morning, go home that same day, but because of that cocktail, you need someone else to drive you. When you arrive, uh, you have a lot of drops placed in your eye in order to first dilate it and then numb the eye. And I actually numb the eye with just drops, so I don't use any needles or anything like that. In the operating room, there's light sedation. You don't have to worry about holding your eye open. I hold it open for you, and there's no pain at all. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. And I do use an operating microscope in order to better see the cataract and insert the lens appropriately. Once you're at the PACU, you get some juice and crackers. Uh, we explain, I know, saltines or graham crackers, it's great. And then um, we explain the instructions and you can go home. After the surgery, as I said, it's normal for the eye to be red, blurry, sensitive to light and scratchy, and the drops do help with this. As far as activities, no sandbags, but um, no eye rubbing, and that's because I don't put any stitches in there and no swimming, jacuzzi, steam room, just because odd things grow in those places, and no heavy lifting. And those are only in place for one week, and after that you can go back to your normal activities. I also ask that you tape a shield on when you're sleeping for a week, just so you don't accidentally rub your eye while you're asleep. And then you can get new glasses about a month after surgery. So, because this talk, they wanted me to focus on some of the newer techniques that we use in surgery, I'm gonna talk about some special situations. Uh, for cataract surgery, and these are things that we see um, more often at Stanford because we're Stanford than you might have someone in private practice talking about, and I'm going to start with traumatic cataracts. So trauma can cause or exacerbate an existing cataract. It can also cause damage to other parts of the eye, and so it's important to realize that if you do have damage to the retina, you know, that's not going to be fixed with cataract surgery, but the other thing it can do it can damage the zonules in the eye, and this can complicate surgery and sometimes even necessitate the need for the lens to be placed in an alternative position. And this can happen even if you had history of you know, trauma when you were a child or when you got in a fight when you were 15. So it's important for us to be prepared for this. And basically, what's a zonule? This is just a cross-section of the eye. Again, um, that's the cornea. The uh, kind of darker brown is the iris, and this is supposed to represent the phaco machine, which is in there removing the cataract. And you can see the cataract sits inside that capsular bag, and that capsular bag is attached to the side of the eye with some little strings there. Those are the zonules, and they're very much like uh, springs on a trampoline. They hold the bag in place during surgery and once your new lens is in there, and if you have trauma, you can actually hurt those zonules, and they can be loose or missing, which can compro compromise the stability of the bag both before, during, and after the surgery. 
So, luckily, they've invented something called a capsular tension ring. And um, basically what happens is we put this inside the eye during surgery if we notice or know ahead of time that there's zonular problems. And this stabilizes that capsule so that I can effectively remove the cataract and put your new lens in. And this remains in the eye, no problem after the surgery. Um, okay, and so this is a video. Oh which um, was, oh, was loud, sorry, guys. Um, which was made by someone and submitted to one of our national meetings and it won the 3D video competition. So the guy who made it wants to show you how good he is at showing you 3D. <laughs> so he's going to show you how it's pulled into the special instrument from the doctor for the doctor from above, as well as from the side. Oh, look how simple that is. He's so good. Um, but he did win. It's actually a really nice video. OK, and this shows it being introduced into the eye. The cataract in this particular example is gone. It goes inside the eye very easily. And he wants to show you it's flexible. Uh, I know it's nice, right? And that's good, because sometimes you need to be able to move it to that site of zonular compromise. So this is a picture of zonular compromise. And you can see the bag looks a little funny, because its springs are missing. And so this shows that it's put into the eye, and then you can centrally put it into place. So that's great. And that's his name. He's Russian. I can't pronounce it. OK. So what about um, other examples when we might use that special capsular tension ring? Well, there's something called pseudo-exfoliation, which actually a lot of people have, um, especially people of Scandinavian descent. And it's officially a peculiar substance, which you see on the lens capsule. It's actually deposited throughout the body, but the only place we really care about it is in the eye. Um, and it causes um, problems with the zonules, which is why we sometimes need to use that ring. But it also increases the risk for glaucoma. So anytime I see this in a patient, I refer them to a glaucoma specialist. And they do just a regular glaucoma workup, which includes um, imaging of the optic nerve in the back of the eye, as well as visual field testing. But because it can cause zonular compromise, we do um, sometimes put that capsular tension ring in. OK, and I, for some reason, I'm missing a little slide, but I'll tell you. So um, the other thing that's important in either of these cases is sometimes if the bag is sufficiently compromised, I do need to place the lens in a different part of the eye. And um, we can put it in front of the iris, in which case it's called an anterior chamber lens. Or sometimes we can suture it into the back. But the important thing for patients is that there's no difference in visual outcome. It just means your surgery takes a couple minutes longer. So what about cataract surgery and Flomax? So I get asked this all the time because now Flomax commercials are on television. And at the end, they always say, ask your eye doctor if you're on Flomax. So the reason is because Flomax does work very well to relieve symptoms of prostate enlargement by relaxing smooth muscle. But it has this side effect in that it relaxes the smooth muscle of the dilator muscle of the iris. And the reason this is important is because I know I should do that video. The iris has to be very well dilated in order for me to see the cataract, to remove it, to do the surgery. And this Flomax reduces the dilation, and it also causes a change in the tone of the actual muscle itself. So the iris can become floppy during surgery, and it can get in the way of the surgeon. And interestingly, this is an irreversible effect. So stopping the Flomax doesn't help. So because of this, I use modifications in my surgical technique in any patient who is either currently on Flomax or a similar drug or has a history of having been on it. I use stronger dilating drops. I sometimes even put dilating medicine into the eye before I start the surgery. I use a special viscoelastic substance to stabilize the iris. But the other thing that's recently uh, become something that's um, more available is either iris retractors or iris rings. Oh, the slides just got mixed up. That's the special anterior chamber lens, and that's the sutured lens. But we're past that now. OK, so here are the iris stabilizers. These are the retractors. And basically, these can be placed into the eye to hold the iris open and hold it stable. Or you can have an iris ring placed in the eye. 
but these, unlike the capsular tension ring, are only placed into the eye temporarily during the surgery, and then they're removed. And again, the key take home is it makes my job much better, but it has no effect on the patient other than the surgery may take 12 minutes instead of 10 minutes. So are there alternative medications you can use if you do have an enlarged prostate? Yes. But who should you ask about those? Your primary care physician. And that's because although there are alternative medications that work in a different way and have a less severe effect on the pupil, as well as other medications that have alternative mechanisms, Anytime you're choosing a medication, you want to do it with your regular doctor so that they can talk to you about the side effects and other disease processes that you have going on. But most importantly to me is that if you do have a history of this, is that you mention it before the surgery so that I can be prepared to do the surgery effectively. So what about astigmatism? Well, this is a special situation where People, and a lot of people have astigmatism. What does that really mean? It means that you have more power in one axis of your eye than in another. So people try and describe it, they say that maybe your cornea is more shaped like a football than a basketball. And what this does is it causes blurry vision throughout your life, and we correct this normally with glasses or contact lenses, or sometimes people choose to have it corrected with LASIK. And the great news is, after cataract surgery, your astigmatism in your cornea will still be there, but you can still correct it with glasses, contact lenses, LASIK if you're a candidate. But there is a new option. There's a special intraocular lens that can be placed during cataract surgery that can manage some of that astigmatism, and it's called a toric lens. It's very similar to the conventional lens I keep showing you except that it has more power in one axis. So what I do is I center or align it inside the eye to counteract the natural astigmatism, and it therefore reduces some need for glasses after surgery. This is just is supposed to show someone who has no astigmatism on the right-hand side. Their eye is like a basketball, but they're like a football on the other side. So they have more power in the horizontal axis. And you would place the lens with the extra power in the vertical axis so that they could counterbalance and therefore reduce the need for glasses. So again, this is the cornea now we're talking about where you have this astigmatism. And this is showing what the cornea looks like if it's shaped like a basketball. But with astigmatism, it's shaped like a football or like the back of a spoon. And astigmatism causes blurry vision both up close and far because it's affecting all distances. It can be corrected with glasses and it can still be corrected with glasses after cataract surgery. And this is just showing severe astigmatism. People who have severe astigmatism can actually have distortion. So this is the special toric lens, and it has more power in one axis. So the idea is you're gonna line up the two using these special alignment guides or markers to counteract the natural astigmatism which occurs in the lens. And at Stanford, we have kind of a special um, machine to help us line that up. So the toric lens, you have less of a need for glasses. You still have probably some residual astigmatism if you choose to have the toric lens over the conventional lens, but your glasses will be much less strong. Okay, so people are all excited about the fact that you can now use um, the laser to assist with cataract surgery. So if you are having something like a toric lens placed, you can have an additional laser procedure before the cataract surgery, and it can do a few steps of the cataract surgery, including placement of a perfectly centered capsulotomy inside the eye using the laser before I get in there to do the traditional cataract surgery. 
And this laser guided centration is more important when you're placing specialty lenses such as the toric lenses I was talking about for correcting astigmatism. So we do offer this at Stanford for people who are having the specialty lenses placed. And Stanford was the first academic medical center on the West Coast to offer laser-assisted cataract surgery using the catalyst femtosecond laser is the name. It's actually based on technology developed at Silicon Valley at a company with its roots at Stanford. Not with me. Um, it consistently and precisely performs many of the steps traditionally done by the surgeon's hand before the surgeon even gets in there. And it is ideal to have this added precision when you're placing that specialty lens like the toric. Um, okay. So as I said, I have, um, I was not part of this and I have no financial interest in the company, but this is the company's video. So um, there's one part I'm going to tell you when, when you got to take it with a grain of salt. But basically, this is the machine. It's beautiful. It sits right next to the OR. And again, they want to show you that a clear lens, you get good, clear images. But if you get a cataract instead, that lens no longer cre can create a good image. Instead, you get distortion or irregularity. And this is supposed to be a nice view of the bridge with a clear lens. And this is how it looks with slow progression over with a cataract. And then if you put them side by side, you see that it's actually pretty dramatic. And perhaps this person would need cataract surgery. And uh, how do you fix this? You remove the cataract magically on this video. And then you put a new replacement lens in, which once again can provide perfectly clear vision. So it's the company, so they want to show you the machine and they want to tell you that it is comfortable, all these wonderful things. But um, for the purposes of this talk, the big question is um, how does it work? So basically, every person's eye is different. So the first thing the machine does is it does a 3D image and map of your specific eye. And the reason it needs to do this is because it has to be based on the specific 3D structures inside your eye, and it's going to follow that map. And um, it's going to show you kind of the traditional surgery, the incision, that's the three millimeter incision, and this is a smaller incision on this side, are made. And then here's the part you're going to take with a grain of salt, because this particular surgeon they're having make the capsulotomy, I think, has the worst tremor I've ever seen. It doesn't really look like that. <laughs> um, but they want to they make it dramatic. <laughs> so the, it usually looks a little bit better than that. OK, so here's how the laser works. Um, it pre-places the incisions before you get in to do the surgery. And the incisions are created by the laser. So you can place them exactly where you want to place them. And here's where it really shines, is that it can then use the laser to create a perfectly centered, perfect circle. And you know, surgeons who are doing this are good. They don't, their circles don't look like that, but the, uh, the laser really is perfect every time. And again, they showed you a very dramatic comparison. But studies do show it's about 10 times more accurate than the traditional capsulotomy. The other thing the laser can do is it can break up the cataract into little pieces using laser energy before you even get into the um, surgery suite. And so um, once you get in there, the capsule that's been, uh, the capsulotomy is removed. And basically, they're showing you on the left side, the traditional surgery, they're using fake emulsification, just like we always do, to break up the lens into the little pieces. and um, and then they're removed from the eye. And they're trying to show you on the right-hand side, because they've pre-broken the lens, perhaps you need to use less phaco emulsification energy to remove the cataract. And um, so less energy from the ultrasound is going into the eye, and it's a little bit quicker. Um, and here's where it's important, though, is what I was talking about, is if you're trying to line up that special toric lens, having a perfectly centered capsulotomy can definitely assist with that. And um, it assists not only with aligning it in centration, but also with tilt, which can be important if you have a lens that has more power on one side than the other. Sorry, guys. 
Okay, so people always say to me, all right, now that I'm done with my surgery, I had a friend and her cataract came back. No, cataracts can't come back. Once they're removed, they're gone forever, okay? But you can have scarring on the back of the bag where that new lens has been placed, and this blurs the vision so it feels like the cataract is coming back. And people used to call this after cataract or secondary cataract, which is why I think there's some confusion. But basically, it's called posterior capsular opacity, and it's just scarring. And luckily, it can be treated very easily in the clinic itself with something called a YAG laser capsulotomy. <laughs> Don't worry, we're almost done. Okay, so this is why everyone thinks their cataract's coming back, because it looks the same. All of a sudden you're like, wait, it's blurry again. It's not what I wanted. So this is showing the bag itself, and you can kind of see that the lens is in there, and it just it's gotten some scar tissue on it. It's actually a natural healing response. It happens in almost a third of all patients who have cataract surgery. But luckily, you don't have to go back to the operating room. It's not another surgery. Basically, I just use a laser in clinic, and the, it's called the YAG laser. And the laser is just used to create a little space so that it folds open and you once again have a clear view. It takes like five minutes. Okay. So, in conclusion, a cataract is a gradual clouding of the natural lens. It's very common. Um, but the question of when to do cataract surgery, well, if it's not bothering you, you don't have to do anything. You can just leave it in there. It's not going to hurt your eye. But if it gets to the point where it's interfering with your activities of daily living, and you have to talk about that with your surgeon, then you can consider surgery. And as I said, compared to heart surgery or almost any other surgery, it's great. You come in the morning, it takes 15 minutes, you go home that same day, just drops to numb the eye. But as with anything, if there are special situations, do discuss these with your doctor. If you have a history of macular degeneration or other things, it's important, history of flow max use. And if you do have astigmatism and are interested in having a toric lens or the special laser, you can talk to your surgeon about that as well. Thank you. All right, and I think uh, we're supposed to have some questions if people have questions. Yes? Uh, I think most of the people here are probably on Medicare. Does Medicare cover all these things? Medicare covers, um, it was explained to me, Medicare likes to cover vanilla ice cream, but not chocolate sauce. So Medicare covers cataract surgery on both eyes. Some countries, they only do one eye. Medicare in the United States covers it on both eyes. And uh, it covers if you needed a special capsular tension ring or if you needed those special iris hooks or things like that. What Medicare currently does not cover, however, is that special toric lens with the laser. And the reason Medicare doesn't cover it is for them, that's kind of like, oh, they're just trying to get out of their glasses. There's not a medical need. They could just have glasses instead. And so currently, Medicare does not cover specialty lenses or procedures associated with specialty lenses. Although you never know, maybe in the future. Yes? Do most people still need to wear reading glasses after they've had cataract surgery? Yes, yeah, so I was supposed to talk about surgery, but <laughs> I knew that question would come up. I didn't put her out there. I didn't plant her. Um, okay, so basically what you're talking about is a, a process called accommodation. So we kind of touched on that briefly where, you know, initially when you're 15, your eye can change shape. You can see in the distance as well as up close. But right around age 40, our eyes are not quite as good. And, um, yeah. Okay, and so I'm going to try and show you a video of that. Oh, hold on one second, guys. I'm sorry. Mm, 
give me a second. Because basically the reason people all talk about that is there are some new lenses. So basically this is showing you how your vision looks, right? And when you're 15 you can kind of see, oh, I'm not sure it's playing, oh, sorry guys. Um, in the distance and maybe up close. And then with time, around age 40, 45, you start to notice that you can't see up close. And this is because, oh, hold on one second, let me just tell you, the natural lens can no longer move. And so with cataract surgery, you put in a new lens, and just like your 50-year-old lens that doesn't move, that new lens doesn't move. Okay, and so you can't accommodate. So after cataract surgery, you might be able to see into the distance, but for reading up close, you're still going to have to put on reading glasses even after cataract surgery in order to make that clear. And it will be clear with your reading glasses on after cataract surgery. And this is, oh, I, now they're going to explain it to you. So basically, this is just the way the lens moves when you're 15, and it can see in the distance and up close. And that's why you're able to do it when you're 15. You just pull it up and you accommodate. That's the term we use to say that the lens is being moved by those muscles so that you can see up close when you hold something in front of you. And in fact, I have a six-year-old and he's always handing me things right here and I'm like, oh, okay, can't quite see it that close anymore. But with age, you have presbyopia, which just means lack of accommodation. And at first we all try to push it out and then at some point our arms just aren't long enough and we have to put some reading glasses on, or that's trying to show you bifocal so you can see in the distance and up close. And the conventional lens implant that is paid for by Medicare does not correct this. Okay, so there are on the market different approaches to fixing this. There are two basic designs, and there are a lot of different companies who will tell you that they have a different design, but two basic designs are currently available. The um, one on the right is a different design than the other two, and basically it, the two on the left are concentric circles, and every other circle is focused on distance vision, and every other circle is focused on near vision. And the one on the right is supposed to be thin enough that it's supposed to be able to move with eye muscles. Um, there are a lot of surgeons who are putting these in people's eyes. And um, I'm not sure uh, they're perfectly designed yet, um, although I am hopeful that uh, future designs are coming that will be um, improvements on these designs. There's one in particular that's kind of exciting. It's a local company. It's called the Power Vision Lens. And it's designed, um, it's, not, it's not available yet. <laughs> I should tell everyone that. It's designed to have kind of bladders around the edges of the lens so that It, um, the, the edges of it, this person clearly also really likes 3D, the edges of it are supposed to allow it to move with the natural eye so that it's more like the 15-year-old lens. So basically it's thought to be placed in the eye and then it's going to use the natural muscles to change those bladders on the edges so that it actually changes shape. The fluid is um, pushed in in this sort of proprietary way to change where the lens is located. So this is just how it works inside the eye. So the natural muscles uh, move the lens just like they did when you were 15 and that causes the fluid to go into the middle lens and push it forward and back just like your natural lens used to. And they've had several press releases in the last couple of weeks, but it's not available yet. Okay, other questions? Yeah? Sorry. Could it later be removed for an improved lens? What? Could you repeat the So her question was, if you had a lens placed now, could you later have it removed if a better lens came along? 
Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, I do that surgery because I'm at Stanford, but it's a very complex surgery to remove someone's lens that's been placed. And that's because of that scar tissue we talked about. It's, um, it's a much more um, involved surgery, and it's not one that's undertaken lightly. Uh, sometimes we have to do it for a variety of reasons, and I can, but I think it's probably better to, um, to try to avoid that if possible. Yeah? who say you can decide whether you want a correction for myopia or whether you want a correction yeah. for farsighted. Yeah, so this is one of the, yeah, sure, I can talk, I can say the question again. So one of the things we talked about is um, when you put the new lens, it's like um, you put in a certain amount of power so that you can see well at one particular distance. And the question is that you as a patient have to decide is which distance do you want that to be? So some people would prefer to be able to drive, see the movies, things like that without their glasses after cataract surgery, and then just put little reading glasses on. Now there's a whole other subset of people who have worn glasses their entire life. They like their glasses, they like the way they look with them on, and they'd like to wear them after surgery for driving and things like that, and just take them off to read because that's what they've always done. They like getting in bed at night and reading without glasses. So that's kind of a personal choice. When would you like to not wear your glasses after cataract surgery? And that's something we talk about. Yes? After I had a cataract surgery in one eye, I got like a, a little flash that would go in. The doctor said it was nothing, it was just floaters. Okay, so let me talk about that. So let me try and go back to the anatomy slide. I think that'll be our best slide. Okay, so yes, the eye on cross section. Okay, so remember I talked about behind the lens, which has become cataractus, there's the back of the eye, and it's filled with this clear jelly like substance called vitreous. And we're, when we're born, it's very clear and very jelly-like, but as we all get older, parts begin to kind of liquefy, and then the solid parts kind of float around in the liquid parts, and if light hits them just right, you'll see a floater. Not dangerous in and of itself. However, the vitreous is attached to the retina in a couple different spots, so it gets, as it gets more and more mobile, it can actually tug on the retina, and the retina has no way of sending to the brain a message I'm being tugged on. So instead it sends flashes of light. And so people see flashes of light. Now if the vitreous tugs on the retina and detaches itself, not a big deal. That's fine. Our, vi our vitreous can move around. It doesn't hurt our eye. We just see some floaters. But if, as it's trying to detach itself, as it becomes more mobile, it actually tears a little hole in the retina, then that fluid can actually get inside that hole and push the retina off, and then it's not a vitreous detachment, it's a retina detachment. And that can cause permanent blindness. So we tell all patients, you know, if you've had floaters forever and you've always had your floaters and they look the same, we're not gonna worry about them once we examine your eye. But if you ever wake up one day and you have hundreds of new floaters or flashes of light, or a curtain that's coming across your vision. It doesn't have to come down, it could come from the side. Then eat and drink nothing, because you may need surgery, and call your retina doctor. And it is possible to have those symptoms occur after cataract surgery. Basically, what it means is if you have you know, a few floaters, your doctor needs to do a full eye exam to make sure you don't have a retinal tear. And as long as you don't have a retinal tear, you're okay. But if you did ever experience any of those other symptoms, it would be important to call right away in order to preserve your vision. Well, it is dangerous because when you're driving, what it does, it stops you from seeing. Oh, the floater? Yeah. Yeah, usually, have, did you only, I don't mean to pry, but did you only have cataract surgery in one eye? Yeah, so often floaters, if you have just good vision in one eye, are very bothersome, but as soon as you have good vision in both eyes, then the brain kind of knows to ignore whenever it sees a floater in one eye, it just pays attention to the other eye. Okay, and I think there was a question all the way in the back. Yeah. Oh, the quality of the lens you uh, put in, does it vary a lot with Medicare, the insurance 
No, 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 no. Medicare pays for a state-of-the-art, fantastic lens. Um, it's wonderful. It has UV protection built in. It has wave front. It's amazing. Yeah, you never have to wear sunglasses again. It's wonderful. Um, the only thing Medicare doesn't pay for is that, that special lens that has that special power in one axis because they think that's like trying to get rid of glasses. It's like plastic surgery. So they don't want to pay for that. Contacts that are monovision. This one's distant, or this one's close up, and this one's distance. Could you put one for distance and one for reading in? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with that. So what she's talking about is in contact lenses. She has one eye that she uses for driving, and one eye that she uses for reading. So the eye that she uses for driving, if she were to cover her reading eye, she couldn't read with it. And the eye, uh, the exact opposite is true as well. If she covered her driving eye, she'd be able to read with her left eye, but not see in the distance with it. But together with both eyes open and her contacts in, she can see it both. So yes, in patients who have done that with contact lenses and loved it, I just do the same thing with cataract surgery, and I set one eye for distance and one eye for near, and they never have to wear glasses again. And Medicare pays for it, so it's fantastic. The key thing is, though, with monovision, is a third of people love it, a third of people think it's okay, and a third of people can't stand it. So I never do it permanently in the eye unless someone's tried it with contact lenses and really liked it, because I'm just a conservative person by nature. Okay. Does, uh, uh, can you use contact lenses rather than glasses uh, to make the correction? Are they equivalent, or is, is there any distinction? After cataract surgery, as you're talking about? Yes, after cataract surgery, you can use whatever you like. You can use glasses, contact lenses. If you're a candidate, you can have LASIK, whatever you prefer. And they work just as well? Yes. Yeah, I had some eczema on the corner of my eyelid here, so I put some cortisone there. And then I read or heard someplace that cortisone cream can cause cataracts. Is, is yeah, that so that's what I was talking about with the steroid. It can. Probably just on the edge, it's you know one time or for a couple of days, it's not going to be a problem. Um, but yes, uh, steroids um, in the eye, if you have to have them for an inflammatory process, especially one that's chronic, can cause it. Um, nasal steroids, because there's a connection between our noses and our eyes, can sometimes cause it. Um, steroids you take by mouth, steroids you take with an inhaler. But uh, the way uh, cataract surgeons look at this is there's probably a good reason you're on the steroids and I can always fix the cataract, so. Okay, yes? Uh, what are the special concerns if you have glaucoma? So glaucoma is a disease that can cause vision loss and cataracts can cause vision loss, but cataracts are reversible with cataract surgery. If you already have loss from glaucoma, that can't be fixed with cataract surgery. Um, cataract surgery, actually, a couple of studies have shown that it, it can, just by itself, decrease the pressure a few, um, well, I'm not sure how many points, but enough that sometimes people actually can get off a drop or two if they're taking them for glaucoma. There are other procedures that you can do in conjunction with cataract surgery for glaucoma if it's indicated that you need some sort of surgical intervention for glaucoma. So you can kind of do two for one kind of surgery. Are you more likely to have complications? Oh, from the cataract surgery? No. Well, okay, I should preface that. So there's certain types of glaucoma where if you have a very small eye and a very narrow angle is what it's called, then you might be at certain, uh, an increased risk for certain complications. But again, I don't know. I, I do the surgery a lot, so we just take precautions. So not usually. Um, yes? Do you work with VA patients? Yes. Um, I actually did my residency at Stanford, so I did a lot of patient's uh, care at the VA when I was a resident. And um, I just uh, recently agreed to go over there and, and do some attending, because I love the VA, too. <laughs> okay, yes? If you have cataract uh, surgery and then in, in the future develop like macular degeneration, does uh, the type of lens that you choose to use uh, 
you, know, you talked about a couple different ones. Is there is there something to watch out for in that event? Which lens you would choose? Yeah. So that you could have good treatment for macular degeneration in the future? Oh, I see what your question. Yes. So, um, uh, there's a couple different answers to your question because your question's broad, so let me just break it down a little bit. So patients who already have macular degeneration, who are going to have cataract surgery, I put in a lens that has not only UV protection built in, but also blue blocking because that's thought to be protective against macular degeneration, so hopefully it uh, helps to slow that progression. Um, Speaking with my retina colleagues, they would prefer um, that patients have uh, a more conventional lens with cataract surgery, so not one of those multifocal ones with the concentric circles, because although for the patient you're supposed to be able to see every other circle in focus, when you look in as a physician, you see every other circle out of focus, and it's difficult to get a good image. So. Um, I think they are a little less enamored with the multifocal lens option in patients that need to have good retinal exams. Sure. Macular edema. Macular edema is swelling of the macula, or the fovea in this particular example. So that's in the retina, and it just gets swollen. It can get swollen because you have macular degeneration. A long time ago, um, there was something called Irvine gas syndrome where people would get macular swelling after cataract surgery. That doesn't really happen um, anymore as often just because we treat the eye with anti-inflammatories, at least at Stanford, both before and after the surgery. You can also have macular swelling if you have diabetes. Remember that picture I showed at the front? And again, all it means is that there's edema or swelling in the macula, and it can be treated often with drops or sometimes injections to help with it. But it does cause blurry vision. Did I answer your question? Okay, yeah? Yes, um, I use blue light therapy for circadian rhythm issues, and based on what you just said to this woman about blue light, does that mean that blue light therapy can cause macular degeneration? You know, the studies are kind of mixed right now, and um, so patients who definitely have macular degeneration, we, we often recommend the blue blocking. Um, but in patients who have circadian rhythm issues, we often will put in a lens that has UV protection, but not the blue blocking portion. And then I just um, educate those patients that if they're gonna go out into the sun, they can buy independent blue blocking sunglasses to wear because there is some evidence to show that blue light is important for circadian rhythm. But it can cause macular degeneration? Are you saying um, there are some studies to show that blue light can exacerbate a certain type of macular degeneration. <coughs> yes? I had uh, cataract surgery on one eye afterwards. After a couple of years, the eye becomes very cloudy. So um, when I'm getting the second one done, I was wondering what can be done to avoid that. So um, without examining your eyes, it's hard to know why your eye became cloudy. As I was kind of showing that video, the most common reason is because of that scar tissue on the bag the lens is placed in. But if you do have that scar tissue and you have an exam, your doctor would be able to see that scar tissue and would probably offer you the laser capsulotomy. Um, which should improve your vision again if that's the only reason you're having decreased vision in the eye that had cataract surgery. Um, and you could do that before proceeding with the second eye, just to kind of maximize the vision in one eye before you do the other eye. And as I said, it takes like five minutes in clinic to do it. As far as preventing it the second time, um, I do a variety of techniques in the surgery to try to decrease the risk of it happening. But if it happened in the first eye, it may very well happen in the second eye. The good news is it's fixed in five minutes, so if that's the reason it shouldn't be a cause for sleepless nights. Well, you're saying different techniques may uh, reduce the chance of having that happen. <coughs> Maybe. But if it happens again, it's pretty easy to fix. Yes? Um, I have a cataract just beginning. Uh, it's no problem at all. But if I were to keep 
UV rays out of my eyes, would that help it? There are some t studies to suggest that prolonged UV exposure uh, can exacerbate them, so they can be worse in people who live at high altitudes and don't wear sunglasses, or um, people who ski or do a lot of hiking without UV protection, sailors, things like that. So um, perhaps that would help, but as an eye doctor, I recommend UV protection anyway, so I think you should do it. <laughs> I said as an eye physician, I recommend UV protection all the time anyway for my patients. So yes, I think you should wear sunglasses. I have protection in these glasses. Perfect. At least I'm told I do. Yes. I don't know if I do or I don't. Yes, I think you probably do. Yes, I think it's good. And then also because I'm a doctor, you should uh, protect your skin as well. Oh, good. OK, yes. Is. With the standard um, cataract surgery, does the lens include UV protection or is that just in special surgery? No. Uh, well, every lens I put in, um, Medicare pays for a lens that has UV protection. All insurance pays for a lens that has UV protection. Good question. Yes? Yeah. I have a follow up to this gentleman's question, which he said he's starting to manifest cataract. Is there any downside to just jumping the gun and taking care of it ahead of problems with lifestyle? Well, yes, remember I talked about bleeding, infection, loss of vision, and the need for additional surgery. Yeah, those are, those are reasons we don't usually just jump right into it. Um, and, you know, new things are being invented daily. Is there any greater risk to the surgery or recovery if the cataract is more advanced than not? So for a long time, no. But then at some point, the cataract gets thick enough that you have to use a lot more energy to remove it. And at some point, it gets thick enough that, do you remember that larger incision? You have to do the larger incision, and you have to put sutures in, and, you know, I can do that surgery. At Stanford, we do it. It's more of a third world approach to cataract surgery. Um, and it works. It takes longer for the surgery as well as longer to recover, but it does work. More questions? I feel like you're about to raise your hand. I have a friend that just had cataract surgery and she developed an infection of the lacrimal duct. Now she has had surgery related to that. Is that common? I mean, people sometimes get it, but it, it's, it's not common, and it's not usually related to cataract surgery. OK. All right, I think that's the end of the group questions, but I'll be here for a few minutes if you guys have individual questions. But thank you for coming.